I don't know if any of you witnessed the World Cup in soccer last year, television. It was won by the Brazilian team. And I have never seen such soccer. That's not the way they taught us to play it in school. As the sports writer in the London Times put it, they danced their way to victory. Because the whole thing was like very fine basketball, bouncing it off almost any part of the body with the capacity to give it direction, with one's back, with one's shoulder, with one's hip, anything, head. It was a, a beautiful art, magnificent spectacle. But you see, we are not taught to do things that way because we are taught that life is serious and therefore must be done in an efficient way, but according to Euclidean ideas of efficiency. In ancient times, when people worked, they used to sing. Hardly anybody sings anymore, except at a performance of some kind or something like that. Imagine a bank teller singing as they were counting out the money. Oh, the king was in his counting house, counting out the money. Five, ten, and twenty, thirty, forty, fifty. <laughs> no. Why not? What would happen if you were confronted by a singing bank teller? would complain to the management. Say, this is money, is very serious. They could sing about it, everything will go wrong. Can you imagine a stockbroker's working song? I uh, have seen people. I once had my shoe shine in a New York subway. That was a most extraordinary performance. But you know? And uh, he was swinging. And imagine, supposing you were a bus driver. You know, most people, when they drive a bus and through city traffic, they are cursing and swearing and being angry and fighting the clock all the way through town. Well, it's a disaster. But imagine driving a bus with the idea that going from here to there wasn't the point, wasn't to get there, but the point was to go and dancing that bus through the streets with a very, very skillfully accurate traffic dodging. And when you get to a stoplight and there's a jam, you play a little tune on the horn. Or you pass jokes to the cab driver near you. Or you play with the passengers. See, anything can be turned into juggling, into playing with balls. That's why we say, have a ball. So this bus driver is swinging through the streets. And he prides himself in the marvel of his Terpsichorean art. But people don't do that. Because work is not supposed to be pleasant. Because you get paid for it. You're not supposed to get paid for enjoying yourself. See, that's what I do. But I think I'm smart. <laughs> I talk to you not because I think I'm doing you any good, but because I like talking about these things. And if you pay me for it, then I make my living. <laughs> as simple as that. <laughs> so I'm a sort of philosophical entertainer. But that's the point. That the transformation of work is swinging it. And the curse of work that came in the story of Genesis, you see. Work became a curse. Because the tree of knowledge was the knowledge not of good and evil in the ordinary sense, but of the advantageous and the disadvantageous. So, work then being regarded as a method of getting there effectively. A lot of businessmen imagine that they are practical people. They say, oh, I don't know for philosophy and that kind of thing, I'm a practical man, I like to get things done. What? And what is practical? Well, you made money, but that's not practical until you spend it, until you enjoy it. And it's very difficult to enjoy money. Money is a great responsibility. Besides, if you get lots of it, you're afraid somebody's going to take it away. It gives you the jitters. You know, lots of people think that if they had a little more money, their problems would be solved. They get it, and they worry about their health. There's always something to worry about if you're the worrying kind. Always. And it can get worse instead of getting better by 
Achieving all those things you think will stop you worrying. So the first principle In, we could call it the art of pleasure, is you must swing. And that means, or at least it looks like, superficially, that you mustn't take anything seriously. You must realize that life is a form of dancing. And dancing is, of course, not serious, and that's why it's prohibited by Baptists and gloomy people of that kind. They don't approve of dancing. Even in the Catholic Church, you don't normally see priests dancing. I mean, it's not because it's sexy. You can dance without partners of the opposite sex. You can dance by yourself. But it's considered undignified. But what is the virtue in being stiff and rigid? As Lao Tzu said, man at his birth is supple and tender, but in death he is rigid and hard. Plants, when young, are juicy and soft, but when old they are brittle and dry. And thus, suppleness and softness are the signs of life, but rigidity and hardness are the signs of death. So, the feminine in the sense of the lilting, the playful, the curvaceous, the soft, is the neglected principle by all us Euclideans. And it is the principle of life and of nature. But the problem that exists for rigid people, and we all get rigid in the sense of resistance, resistance to life, resistance to change, is how on earth do I stop that syndrome which makes me go uptight? How do I stop that? Because it's useless. Almost useless. That sensation of totally unnecessary strain that exists all the time. That is the ego. The physical referent of the idea ego. Just that unnecessary strain. Because that tells you you exist. And so that rigidity of holding against life so that I maintain my shape, my form, my place, all the time, that constant resistance makes you uptight and unable to swing through fear of what will happen if you let it wiggle. And so therefore a non-wiggly person is unadaptive in a wiggly world. And so you get these insectual, mechanical-like behavior patterns that have to go on, 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 regularly, always the same, chug, 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 chug. And they're not adaptable. Because you're too rigid. You don't swing in the wind. And so you're going to collapse.